Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, in anticipation of your reading of the second section of Looking for Alaska, I thought it would be good to uh, review with you a little bit what happened in the first since it's been a little while since we have read this book. Um, so the book opens and we're introduced to Miles, who is our main character. And he is having a going away party and he is going to a boarding school. And uh, just so you're aware of what that means, a boarding school is a school that uh, you go live at. So um, you, you don't go home uh, during the week, at least. Um, and the name of the boarding school that Miles is going to is called Culver Creek, Culver Creek, C-U-L-V-E-R. And uh, so he, he has this going away party and Miles doesn't really want the going away party to happen, but it does anyway, because his mom uh, needs, she, she needs to acknowledge something uh, of him going away and kind of stepping out into um, onto his own. And what we see about Miles from the, the going away party is that he doesn't have very many friends, um, if any at all. So he's got two people that show up to his party and, you know, both of them he would rather not see. And so Miles's relationships with the people that are around him are kind of anemic and, and unhelpful. And uh, he's just kind of like a sad, kind of angsty, depressed person that doesn't know really who he is. And that's what we're going to find out um, throughout the course of this book is who is Miles. Um, something else that we find out about him is that he loves last words. And when he is going away to uh, the boarding school, he quotes this uh, poet, I go to seek a great perhaps. And that in the great perhaps is going to be a theme that happened that is recurring throughout. So the, these these quotes are going to be really important throughout this story. So spend a couple of minutes and just think about what it means to seek a great perhaps in the first place, right? To seek out an adventure, something that might have been that wouldn't have otherwise been. Okay. Uh, so fast forward a little bit, Miles goes off to boarding school. He meets his roommate, Chip Martin, who is called the Colonel. And Chip gives Miles a nickname. Uh, he becomes Pudge. Right. So from this point forward, you're going to see kind of a divergence in Miles where he becomes these two separate people. Right. And one on one hand, he's, uh, you know, he's Miles. Right. He's the he's the sad boy that his family knows. Right. That relationship. And then he's going to start to become somebody else in this in, you know, embodying his nickname as Pudge. And it's going to be all of the new friends that he makes and new people that he meets. That's going to be the that's going to be Pudge. Right. So uh, we meet again. We meet the colonel. We meet uh, the eagle, uh, Mr. Starnes. He's the dean of students there. So he's responsible for discipline. He's the. If the, as much as there could be a bad guy in this story, he's the bad guy. But he's he's not really the bad guy. You know, he's he's he would be the same as like Coach Morris. You know, and Coach Morris is going to write you up if you do something stupid. But it doesn't mean he's like the bad guy on campus. You know, um, so think about it kind of like that way. They like. They like the eagle, but they have this kind of relationship where they're trying to get away with stuff and the eagle's trying to catch them. Okay, kind of like Tom and Jerry a little bit. And then we meet Alaska, who uh, Miles immediately has a crush on. And we are also introduced to these two factions that are happening within Culver Creek. So they're two cliques, the weekday warriors, 
and these kids are wealthy and they get to go home on the weekends, which is why they're called the weekday warriors. And then we have the boarders, which are the poor kids who don't really have a home to go home to, and they just live at Culver Creek. So these two groups are going to be button heads throughout the story, and they're going to kind of drive the action forward. So uh, we're going to be talking about conflict a lot and the different types of conflict. So we have, uh, you know, character versus character with, you know, Miles and Chip versus the Eagle. Um, we have characters versus characters with the weekday warriors versus the borders. We have character versus himself between Pudge and Miles. So we have all these different things that the author is setting up so far. And then uh, the last thing that I want to talk to you about is Alaska's notion of the labyrinth. So, so this notion of the labyrinth um, is going to be really important throughout this whole thing. And uh, so just, just to kind of tell you what a labyrinth is. And Alaska quotes this, right? So how, how am I going to get out of this labyrinth? So uh, in Greek mythology, the labyrinth was this really, really complicated maze. And it was designed to house and trap the Minotaur, who is this mythical monster that's like really fierce. And it's a, a mixture of a bull and a man. And so they build this maze to keep the Minotaur trapped so that it can't get out. Because if it gets out, they're gonna, um, there's going to be a deadly consequence. Um, so we see labyrinths in places other than Greek mythology. Um, you know, so here's another illustration of you know, the, the Theseus in the Minotaur's labyrinth. So he's being stalked by this monster in this, in this complicated maze. Um, this is one of my favorite labyrinths, and this is in a uh, cathedral. And basically, the, uh, the point is of this labyrinth is that you enter here, and then you make your way toward the center. And what it's symbolic of is seeking God or seeking the truth. So it's just an illustration that the path to... God and the path to truth is not straightforward, but complex and complicated and winding. Um, and so, you know, you have Alaska alluding to this idea of the, the, pilgrim the pilgrimage of life and how do we escape the labyrinth? And so without spoiling too much for you about what happens in the future of the story, Alaska's goal here is going to, she, she equates this labyrinth with suffering and she's going to be talking about how, how do I escape my suffering? And so that's, that's part one of looking for Alaska. I hope you guys are enjoying the book so far and I hope this video kind of helped you to understand it a little bit. So uh, check back for analysis of part two, and we'll, we'll talk to you guys soon. Hope you're well.